I like that phrase, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. It's been a delight for me to consider the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is at the root and basis of our confidence before God, is that when Jesus made an offering to God, to be the Lamb of God, that he offered an offering in righteousness himself. Whenever John saw Jesus coming down the path, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You know, when Abraham was taking Isaac up the mountain to make that offering that God had told him to make, he laid the wood upon his son in the fire, and they were going up the mountain. And Isaac said unto his father, Father, Abraham said, Here am I, son. He said, We have the wood and we have the fire. He said, But where is the lamb? And Abraham said something that the import of that I, I know Abraham didn't know, but what a marvelous thing he said. My son, God will provide himself a lamb. Men had been providing lambs for years. That was the prescription that God had required, that they provide a lamb, keep it up, and offer it. According to the prescription there in the, in the Exodus, when they had made their Exodus there at the Passover. But in John 1, 29, John announces this, that God has provided himself a lamb. Yes. And being a provision from God, this was the assurance that this was a righteous lamb. God cannot provide what is not good. God cannot provide what is not perfect. God cannot provide what is not righteous. How true it is when James said, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Okay? God cannot offer something that is inconsistent with his nature and person. What he offers is itself an expression of who God is. The chief thing that God has offered by way of a gift that has come down from heaven is the Son of God himself. He is the chief gift from God. Jesus himself said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Jesus came from God. He is, in fact, the Son of God. How many times we have this testimony, Peter himself testified, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He come from God. John testified, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. See? Paul declared, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. And then he tells you the chief quality of his Son, that he is who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. When it comes to nature, there are no distinctions between the Father and the Son. Jesus himself said, I and the Father are one. It's so important to nail this down in our heart, in our minds, to see this, and in our hearts, for this to be established, that what God offered as the Lamb of God was chiefly a righteous offering. A righteous offering. He was, according to the prescription of the Passover, when it was instituted there at that last plague, which brought the people of God out of Egypt, they were to offer a lamb without blemish. And Peter echoed that word many years later, that the blood of Christ is, in fact, precious blood because he is as a lamb without blemish and without spot. And I just want to confirm that to you this morning. It's been delightful just to go back and to consider the life of Christ and to see that he is altogether righteous. He is righteous. Being provided by God as the Lamb of God, that he is righteous. He is that, okay? In fact, if you trace Jesus back to his beginnings, in fact, we find at the very beginning of his life, he was, in fact, righteous. Remember the angel, whenever Joseph had this conflict because Mary was found with child and Joseph was a righteous man. He wanted to do things that were proper and right. What was he to do with this circumstance? So the angel came and gave this explanation. He said, That fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. 
See? We trace our beginnings back to Adam. You can't trace Jesus' beginnings back to Adam. Jesus is the son of man, but he is not the son of Adam. His father is God because he came down from above. See? He is truly a righteous man. But can the righteousness of Jesus be confirmed? I've been going through 1 John and looking at this and considering righteousness and all these things that are said in 1 John, but I had never attached 1 John 3, 7 with Jesus. And here's what he said. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. And that is true of the children of God. If they're born of God, they in fact do what is right. But isn't it also preeminently true of the one who has come from God, the only begotten son? Can we confirm that Jesus is righteous? Indeed we can. Let's make just a quick survey of his life. From birth to 12 years old, we don't get a lot of details. But we do get this general word from the Spirit. In Luke chapter 2, verse 40, after his presentation to the Father, see, as prescribed for all males who were first born to be presented to God, the Scripture says the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Consider that the great kind of bookend between the time he came into the world until the time he was 12 years old. Now we get this marvelous picture of Jesus. Here he is, 12 years old. They come up to Jerusalem because it's the time of Passover. And where do you find Jesus? You find the Jesus in the place that you find anybody who's godly and righteous, in the temple. In fact, the truth be known, you want to discover where people's affections lie then go to the place where they go. That's where their affections lie. Where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart will be. And Jesus' treasure was in the temple. You may recall it was said of him when he was in that temple that he was actually in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. That tells you about his advancement. I found it's a lot more difficult to ask good questions than you might think. Jesus was asking good questions. And he was given good answers, no doubt. Well, in the midst of all that, the great company of his family had left Jerusalem. They were three days out before they finally realized that Jesus wasn't in the midst. So they had to come back to Jerusalem. And when they did, Mary gave this word to Jesus. Don't you understand the care that we have had for you? We sought you sorrowing. We didn't know what had happened. And Jesus just says, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? What a marvelous word. What a testimony to the righteousness of this man, this young man at 12 years old, already being compelled and driven by the purpose of the living God. He was about his father's business. If we could capsulate the first 30 years of Jesus' life, because we don't have a lot of details, I think we could do just the word from God from heaven at his baptism. When the father was revealed in that time in an audible voice, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. First 30 years right there. See, I'm showing you he's the lamb of God. He's a righteous offering. He's a righteous offering. The next three years, we get a number of snapshots of Jesus' life, and I'll just give you a few of these things. For example, he goes right from his baptism. He's driven into the wilderness by the, by the Spirit, mind you, to be tempted, and he prevails over those three temptations. Again, you see his prodigious ministry and work towards his Father in Luke 5, 15 through 16. Much, the scripture says, but so much the more went there a fame abroad of him. He was prodigiously working for the Father. The fame went abroad and grew great multitudes gathered together here and were healed by him of their infirmities. But then it says this, and he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Now here's the Son of God. Hey, this is the way it works. The more you do for God, the more you got to withdraw. That's the way it is. Got to withdraw. This is Jesus choosing the good and refusing the evil. Amen. He knew you had to be sustained. This is, like, this is like an act of righteousness. See, there are other men, if, if, if fame had got a hold of the men, hey, they wouldn't be thinking about God at all. But here's the righteousness of Jesus. He withdraws to be with the Father. Jesus cleansed the temple, mind you, at the time in which the Passover was at hand. 
And boy, this was a serious offense. If I could say this just briefly, I will say it this way, that the money changers had made religion convenient. At the time when Passover was at hand, and I'll tell you right now, there was anything but convenience from the father's perspective in putting away sin and from the son's perspective in putting away sin. You could see why this is so offensive to the son of God who is focused and knows exactly why he came into the world and for Passover to be coming at hand and for men to be making an approach to God convenient, you couldn't have been more offensive. And he took a cord of whip and he drove those money changers out, overturned their tables. What was that? The zeal of thy house hath eaten me up. It was a work in righteousness. I'm just confirming to you through the life of Christ that he was, in fact, righteous. He did righteous, therefore he was righteous, even as he was righteous. Because being righteous was critical to the offering that he would make. We could look at a number of things, but now let's just consider just some summary statements of his entire life. Jesus says this, which of you convinceth me of sin? How about that? None. We never got an answer on that, did we? He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not let me, for I always do those things that please him. Have you thought of this? I'll just say this and move on. The thing that qualified Jesus to be an offering for sin endeared him to the Father, which tells you what a sacrifice this was from the Father's perspective. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. That's the Father's perspective. Peter himself testified that he did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Is he the only begotten son? Indeed. He stands alone in this regard. He does. He was a righteous offering, and here's my point here. You know, one of the things that happened, and I hope you can see this, because this is something that's been kind of new to me to recognize this, that when Abraham was taking his son Isaac to make him an offering, the scripture records this account that he laid out the wood and that he bound his son with cord and laid him on that wood. Now, I don't think he bound him because the son was rebellious, because I get no idea that Isaac was rebellious, as if he would run off or something. That's not why he bound him. Now, I don't know specifically what was in the mind of Abraham and why he bound him, but I can tell you this. This is a marvelous foreshadowing to the Christ. The very thing that made Jesus the proper lamb, which was his righteousness, would move him to recoil from being made sin for all the world. And thus was he grappling in the garden. Let this cup pass from me, right? I mean, I think it's hard for us to understand what it is to suffer this way, except that we suffer being tempted. Now, you get some idea of what it is to be righteous and then to have to grapple with some form of unrighteousness, okay? I don't think we'll ever fully know what this was like. See, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Can you, get, can you sense the incongru- incongruity between the nature of Jesus and sin? He, had, he made him to be sin. But was Jesus a willing offering? Indeed, he was. You know the cords that bound Jesus? His own righteousness? And because God gave him a commandment, lay your life down. And when he saw in the roll of the book that it was written of him to do his will, his own righteousness could not help him but to offer himself in sacrifice. Because it's what God wanted. Amen. That the world may know that I love the Father. If you ever wonder if Jesus is righteous or does Jesus love the Father, when he came out of the garden, he came out in this word. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Father, we thank you so much for the righteousness of Christ. We delight in it very much. We know that it was the occasion for great sacrifice, both on your part and on the part of your beloved Son. But, Father, our thoughts, the meditations of our heart and of our mind this very day is to this end. We thank you for what you've done. We know it came at great cost, but we, are, we rejoice in this great salvation. And we rejoice in the one man who, could, who is the only man who could possibly be 
the appropriate offering for sin, that righteous one, the very Lamb of God that you provided. And so as we sit here and rejoice in the liberty that we have in Christ of being free from sin, we say unto you, Father, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.